Good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. N. Edward Duran, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the LGBTQ and Solo Mom and Dad Family Building webinar, the medical and legal lowdown. And I'm uh, joined today by Lynn Goldman, who is a, a legal expert and assisted reproduction attorney. And she's going to do the second part of the webinar. So it's going to be about 20 minutes of my presentation, uh, followed by Lynn Goldman's presentation. And then we'll have ample time for questions and answers. Um, a little housekeeping reminder, um, please use the Q&A section rather than the chat uh, in the application to submit your questions. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I grew up here in Atlanta, uh, originally from Buenos Aires, Argentina, speak Spanish fluently. Uh, both my mother and father were physicians here in Atlanta and they had five boys, uh, uh, which four of us became doctors. Uh, I went to Woodward Academy for eight years, uh, the Medical College of, or University of Georgia, and then the Medical College of Georgia here in Atlanta. I did my residency in OBGYN at William Beaumont Hospital in Michigan, and then completed my fellowship in reproductive endocrinology and fertility at Washington University in St. Louis. So the presentation format for my section will be, we're going to talk about the fertility evaluation, uh, some treatment options, including insemination and in vitro fertilization, and some uh, recent advances in IVF. So the initial evaluation is to document ovulation. So we wanna make sure that the woman's ovulating efficiently. This can be done with a progesterone blood test. In addition, uh, this helps understand how these hormones interact. So there's a signal from the hypothalamus to the pituitary that causes the pituitary gland to release FSH, which stands for follicle stimulating hormone. And it does just that. It stimulates the ovaries to release eggs. And then LH, which is what is detected in the urine when you are doing ovulation predictor kits. And that's the surge that causes the release of the egg. And these hormones feed back to the brain to cause these uh, complex interactions. One hormone that we measure to evaluate ovarian reserve is called the AMH or anti-mullerian hormone. The advantage of this is that it can be measured at any time in the menstrual cycle, uh, even on patients that are on birth control pills. And it gives us some idea of how many eggs they would grow in a conventional IVF cycle. So an idea of ovarian reserve. The important concept with AMH is that it has nothing to do with egg quality. Egg quality is most closely correlated to the patient's age, but not uh, an AMH value. The important thing for eggs is all women are born with the eggs they're gonna have for their lifetime. And that number diminishes over time. So on average, you're gonna have anywhere from uh, 350 to 400,000 eggs at age 12. And at age 21 or at age 51, when most women enter menopause, all the eggs have depleted. A woman will average uh, 400 eggs released in her reproductive lifespan. So what that means is that the majority of eggs undergo apoptosis or programmed cell death. The next part of evaluating uh, fertility is to look at the status of the fallopian tubes. And this is done with an HSG or hysterosalpingogram commonly referred to as the dye test. And here on the left side of your screen, you see a normal dye test where the dye fill or spills out of both fallopian tubes and spreads throughout the pelvis. And that's normal. Uh, contrast that to the right where you see both fallopian tubes are filled with dye, but none of the dye escapes the tubes. This is called the hydrosalpinx. And when this happens, we do recommend removing the tube surgically because the fluid that accumulates in the fallopian tubes is toxic to the embryos. And even if you were to do IVF to uh, try to achieve a pregnancy, uh, the hydrosalpingis could uh, inhibit that or contribute to an early miscarriage. The other evaluation that we do here in the office is called a hysteroscopy, making sure that the uterine cavity is healthy and normal. 
here you see examples of fibroids on the upper left, a polyp on the lower right, and a septum in the center. All these can be associated with infertility and uh, miscarriage. Endometriosis affects about 14% of all reproductive age women, but it is as common as 60% of all women that have infertility. So this is an interesting study from uh, Dr. Cameron Najat in, at Stanford University, where he had a group of about 65 patients that had two, uh, two years of infertility and had failed two previous IVF cycles. None of the patients had previously been diagnosed with endometriosis. So half the women underwent a laparoscopy where he found about 65% of the patients did have significant endometriosis and the other half of the women did not have the laparoscopy. When you look at the pregnancy rate, what's remarkable is that when they were followed for two years after the surgery, the pregnancy rate is significantly higher in patients that had the diagnosis and treatment of endometriosis. And even more remarkable is that half of the patients, more than half of the patients that conceived after the surgery did so spontaneously without IVF or insemination or any fertility treatment at all. So this is important concept to make sure that if you're being evaluated for fertility, especially if you have painful periods, to um, look for and treat endometriosis. And I do perform a lot of robotic uh, endometriosis surgery, as well as fibroid removal surgery and tubal reversal surgery. So this is the newest way to perform surgery where it's minimally invasive. Uh, the vast majority of patients go home the same day. Recovery is much quicker and less risk of scar tissue bleeding or infection. So we're gonna switch gears to the Mayo evaluation, which is pretty simple. We do a semen analysis, and here we're looking at the volume of the sperm, the, the amount of the liquid, uh, the concentration of the sperm in the uh, semen ejaculate, as well as the motility, and very importantly, Kruger's strict morphology which describes the shape of the sperm. So here on the left, we see a normal sperm with the normal uh, size and shape to the head, mid piece and tail. And here on the right, you see a, an assortment of abnormalities that would prevent a natural normal uh, fertilization with IVF or IUI. Um, the important thing is you only need more than 4% of the sperm to be normally shaped to be considered normal fertility. So the treatment options that we offer include ovulation induction um, with uh, insemination. So that typically entails using oral fertility medications like Clomid or Letrozole to try to help women ovulate more efficiently. And then combining that with insemination, which is, can be done with donor sperm insemination. Um, it could be a known donor or an anonymous donor. We'll talk about that as well. Um, and then there's in vitro fertilization, which has been around since 1978 and has dramatically improved in success rates over the last 10 to 15 years. And that's where we remove eggs, create embryos, and then transfer them back into the uterus of the patient. It could be the patient's partner if they're doing co ivia or it could be a gestational carrier. So for the IUI procedure, uh, this is what it looks like schematically. It's just placing sperm in the uterus. Think of it as stacking a deck from both sides, trying to improve ovulation and increase the number of sperm that make it uh, to the top of the uterus and therefore will have a better chance of making it to the egg. The important thing with IUI is that the success rates haven't changed over the last 50 to 60 years because we're really not doing anything to facilitate fertilization we're just kind of assisting uh, the woman to ovulate and the success rate is about uh, 15 to 20% per cycle. So that compares to in vitro fertilization where we stimulate the ovaries to grow eggs, remove the eggs, create embryos, and then transfer them back into the uterus. When I started doing IVF 28 years ago, the standard practice was to remove the eggs, create the embryos, and very quickly 
over the next two or three days, put them back in the uterus because we weren't confident and efficient in our laboratory techniques to maintain the embryos alive. And we weren't able to effectively freeze them and thaw them with uh, high survival. Both of that, both of those things have changed. And now we're able to grow the embryos to the blastocyst stage, which is the stage right before implantation. And we're able to reliably freeze the embryos and thaw them and have them survive. So now the standard of care is to remove the eggs in one cycle, create embryos, and then in a separate cycle, do a frozen embryo transfer, which has a higher success rate. This shows the ICSI procedure. So this is a direct sperm injection. You can see a sperm picked up by the needle and then directly injected into the egg. This started in 1993, and this has revolutionized IVF, both for male factor, unexplained infertility, and in patients that have diminished ovarian reserve and are older. You see the shell here around the egg. This is called the zona pellucida, and this becomes thicker with time and more resistant to natural fertilization. So especially in women over 40, the uh, use of ICSI is very uh, critical to their success. Once we get the oocyte, which is the largest single cell in the body, we fertilize it with the direct sperm injection. Here we see a zygote, which is the uh, single cell embryo that shows evidence of fertilization and we monitor the progress all the way to the blastocyst stage, which is about five to seven days of embryo development. For lesbian couples, we have the option of donor sperm IUI, which a lot of couples choose because if they haven't had exposure to pregnancy, it's very likely that they could get pregnant in the first to three, for in one to three cycles of this treatment. We also do uh, IVF where it can be one partner uh, produces the eggs and carries the baby. Um, it could be where one person in the couple uh, produces the eggs, the embryos are created with donor sperm, and then with co-IVF, you have the uh, other partner have her uterus prepared where she actually carries the baby. So they're both participating in the process. One is uh, giving the egg, and the other one is carrying and giving birth to the baby. And this is quite popular. For male partners, it uh, consists of using an egg donor uh, along with either one partner or both partner sperm can be used. And then we use a gestational carrier. So that is a woman that has proven fertility and, and ability to carry a healthy pregnancy. And then she is contracted to provide this service for the couple. For transgender, it's important that you bank sperm before you um, have your uh, gender confirming surgery uh, and also that you freeze eggs as well. So these issues should be addressed as you're approaching gender confirming surgery and going on home hormone therapy um, in uh, the future. So what can be done to improve pregnancy rates? Well, I've seen tremendous progress in the 28 years that I've been doing IVF. When I started, it was a 14% success rate for IVF. If you recall, that's similar to what IUI is. And now uh, in our clinic, the success rate last year was 60%. So to have the success rate quadruple in just under 30 years is a, a spectacular advancement. So we're gonna talk about the different types of IVF. Uh, IVF, when it started, was natural cycle, but then it, the success rates were so low that we started to inject a lot of medication, and this is what we call conventional IVF, and then um, producing more eggs. So the, the concept is to sometimes use birth control pills or Lupron to take over the cycle, and then shut down the all signals from the pituitary gland using Lupron, so this causes a temporary artificial menopause followed by adding back or injecting high doses of gonadotropin. These doses are much higher than the body would ever produce. And women will often make 20 or 30 eggs. The negative aspect of conventional IVF is that it can have a negative impact on the egg quality. 
So we want to make sure that we don't use too much medication because that can be a problem. With natural cycle IVF, it's using no fertility drugs. And this is sometimes for personal preference. Other times it could be that the patient uh, has a estrogen uh, sensitive cancer history. Uh, and it is uh, much more cost effective. With natural cycle IVF, we don't use any medication at all. And this shows the schematic of how it compares to conventional. And the candidates for natural cycle would be someone that doesn't want to have excess surplus embryos, someone that has tubal disease or male factor, uh, patients that have hormone sensitive cancers, and then some women that have high FSHs or diminished ovarian reserve in their 40s, because by giving more FSH, you're typically not going to get any more eggs. So they do just as well with natural cycle. Um, the goal with minimal stimulation IVF is kind of the sweet spot between conventional and uh, the natural cycle IVF. So these patients will often make six to eight eggs. They tend to be of higher quality, uh, fewer side effects, obviously, for the patient, lower risk of hyperstimulation. So with this, the important thing is that we start with oral medication like Clomid or Letrozole at the beginning of the cycle. And this is where the natural recruitment occurs that we think has a significant impact on the resulting egg and embryo quality. And then we use a few injections near the end. So women, the best candidates for natural side or for minimal stimulation would be women that have uh, normal ovarian reserve, women that don't want to use a lot of medication, women that have polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, certainly women that are trying to avoid the complications of uh, hyperstimulation. And I do see a lot of patients that have failed conventional IVF due to the poor egg and embryo quality, and they're looking for an alternative. And this is a, a big segment of my practice and uh, extremely successful. So with uh, new advances in IVF, now we are able to do pre-implantation genetic screening. And this is where we biopsy the embryos uh, and when we do the biopsy, we're able to determine if it's a boy or a girl, if it's genetically normal or not. So with PGTA, it's a general screen of all 23 chromosome pairs, looking for things like Down syndrome and things like that. There is PGTM, and that's where we are looking for specific gene defects, and this could be for cystic fibrosis, for breast cancer, colon cancer. So we are able to impact the cancer history of a family moving forward. The new freezing technique is called vitrification. The way to think about that is the old technique was using slow freeze, which is like getting a glass bottle, filling it with water, sealing it, and placing it in your freezer. As it slowly freezes, the water expands and that glass shatters. Similarly, the embryo can become damaged with this slow freeze technique. Now what we use is we use vitrification, which is passing the embryos through a series of culture media where we're able to extract the fluid. Think of it as converting a grape into a raisin and then freezing the raisin. Uh, when we thaw the raisin, we put it through the culture media and it becomes a grape and we get virtually 100% survival. This shows the impact of the PGTA testing especially in women uh, over 35. So what you see is the success rate, and this is from Life IVF Center where I practiced for eight years in California, and there are large uh, minimal stimulation IVF center doing over 3,000 cycles a year. So what this shows is that for all the frozen embryo transfers, the success rate um, went down with age as expected, but when you introduce the genetic testing, you had virtually the same success rate for women over 43 compared to under 43 or 34. And here you see a summary of 6,400 embryo biopsies that shows the inflection point around 35 where the percentage of genetically abnormal embryos uh, far exceeds the normal number. <clears throat> and the concept of embryo banking, whereas women get older, they require four more embryos to have a greater than 50% chance of having a genetically normal embryo. With um, 
IVF, if you do the PGTA testing, it actually is more cost effective because if you were to transfer an abnormal embryo that was unsuccessful and had to come back for another frozen embryo transfer, it would end up costing more than just testing the embryos in advance. So this concludes my portion of the presentation. I'm gonna let Lynn Goldman take over her part and I look forward to answering y'all's questions in the near future. Good morning, everybody. I'm Lynn Goldman, and just a little bit about me. Um, I have been an attorney for 24 years. Um, and um, Caroline, if you could do the next slide, that would be great. Okay, so I've been an attorney for 24 years. Um, prior to that, I was a social worker. Um, and I've been practicing adoption and assisted reproduction law for the last eight years. Um, I'm a partner with the firm of Claiborne Fox Bradley Goldman. Um, and our firm also owns a surrogacy agency um, called Southern Surrogacy. Um, and I am one of the directors there as well. Um, I also personally have twins through IVF. They are 20 now. Um, so I went through um, IVF for many, many years um, to have my own children. So, Caroline, can we go to the next two slides? Okay, so I'm gonna keep going um, and, um, okay. So in my world of, of fertility law, um, we find that babies come from adoption, sperm and egg donation and embryo donation um, and co-IVF or reciprocal IVF, um, and then also through surrogacy. So just to talk about the different laws that pertain to fertility. Um, and in Georgia, we have both statutory law and then we also have case law that came out of our Supreme Court and our Court of Appeals um, relating to fertility. But we have very few laws, statutory laws, um, and even case law in Georgia pertaining to fertility. But it does not mean that we can't do, you know, surrogacy or, or gamete donation, which is egg, sperm, embryo donation. So we're gonna start with gamete donation. Okay, so in Georgia, we do not have laws, uh, statutory laws specific to sperm or egg donation. Um, we do have a statute pertaining to embryo donation. Um, that statute number, if you would like it, is 19841. Um, but understand that we do also have a statute, our second statute in Georgia, which is 19721, pertaining to children that are conceived um, by IUI or artificial insemination that are born within wedlock, meaning to two parents that are married, um, those parents are considered irrebuttably presumed to be the legal legitimate parents of both of those spouses. But understand we do have a court of appeals case, or excuse me, a Supreme Court case, um, Patton v. Vanderpool, that actually says that this statute, 1971, does not apply to children conceived um, using IVF. So because of that, um, the NCLR, the National Center for Lesbian Rights, recommends that whether you're married or not, um, they encourage that the biological parent um, do a second step of doing an adoption or a parentage order um, to make sure that you're on the birth certificate and that your legal rights are declared. All right, we'll go to the next slide. Let's talk about what that contract for sperm, egg, or embryo donation looks like. Um, that contract needs to include language um, that transfers ownership from the donor to the recipient. Um, if you're receiving donor gametes, again, sperm, egg, or embryo, um, from a bank, um, the bank will have documents that serve as a contract transferring that ownership. Um, but if you're using a um, egg or sperm agency where they're matching you with a particular donor and you're going through um, a fresh retrieval of eggs or sperm, um, you will need a contract. Or if you are working with a known donor, you will need um, a, a contract um, for that donation. And you wanna make sure that, again, that, that contract transfers ownership, but understand that you cannot pay for gametes. Um, what you can pay for, you can pay for attorney fees, you can pay for the cost to store those, um, those gametes, um, and then you can also pay for, if you're doing a fresh cycle, any retrieval. 
but you cannot pay somebody for genetic material. Um, and again, our only statutes in Georgia um, is for embryo donation. But again, it does not mean that you cannot do sperm and egg donation in Georgia, because you can. And we do it all day, every day. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about uh, co-IVF or reciprocal IVF, and that's our next slide. Um, and again, this is um, using an egg from one mother to the womb of a second mother, um, using usually donor, um, donor sperm and IVF. So since you're using IVF, remember that Supreme Court case I mentioned before, Vanderpool does not apply. So we recommend, um, and the NCLR also recommends that a spousal adoption be done once the child is born or getting a post-birth order um, from the court to make sure that those parentage rights are declared. So one thing I also just wanna mention is sometimes people believe that if they're on the birth certificate, that makes them a legal parent. It does not. So just being on the birth certificate does not mean you're a legal parent. So sometimes you do have to take a second step of doing a spousal adoption, like in the instance of a co-IVF. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Okay. So we're gonna talk about surrogacy in Georgia. So we do not have statutes um, about surrogacy in Georgia. Um, we actually um, use our declaratory judgment law um, to be able to get a pre-birth order declaring that the intended parents um, are the legal parents. We've been successful for you know, 20 plus years on that. So um, we do surrogacy all the time in Georgia. Um, so for surrogacy, there's a two-part legal process. Um, there's the contract between the intended parents um, and the surrogate. Um, and we'll talk about what that contract looks like. And then the second step is um, when your surrogate is in, um, or gestational carrier, another term for that, um, is in their second trimester, we will get a pre-birth parentage order declaring the intended parents as the legal parents um, and removing that presumption um, that your gestational carrier has any parental rights um, that they are presumed to have because they are giving birth. Um, to the child. All right, so we're going to talk about um, where do you find a surrogate? So sometimes people um, find a surrogate independently through a family or a friend um, or through social media sometimes. And other people use an agency like Southern Surrogacy or other agencies um, to match them with a surrogate and to manage the, the process. Um, you want to make sure that your surrogate um, is both medically and psychologically cleared um, by your doctor and by a psychologist that your doctor recommends. You also want to make sure that your surrogate has insurance coverage that will pay for prenatal care because there are some insurance policies that do have exclusions that say if you are a gestational carrier or surrogate um, that any prenatal care or delivery um, will not be covered by that insurance. So you want to have that insurance reviewed um, there are um, agencies like Art Risk and other agencies that will do that review for you. And we recommend that you do that before you get started because you don't want to be in the middle of a pregnancy and all of a sudden your bills are not getting paid. Um, you also want to make sure that your surrogate, where she lives and where she's going to give birth, is a surrogate friendly state. There are some states, um, Michigan is one of them, Louisiana is another one, that are not surrogate friendly. And so it's difficult. Um, or sometimes even impossible to get a pre-birth parentage order declaring your legal parentage. All right, we'll go to the next slide. Great. So let's talk about what is in that surrogacy agreement. So it is not a form. Sometimes people think we just rip it off our notepad and you know hand it over to our clients. It actually is a very specific contract between the surrogate and the intended parents. Um, we highly recommend, and ASRM highly recommends that there be an attorney for both the surrogate and the intended parents because they are on opposite sides of that contract. I mean, there is negotiation that happens with that contract. Um, and so both parties need to have their own attorney. And I highly recommend that it be an attorney that practice fertility law, not family law, fertility law. There's a difference. Family law is, um, you know, attorneys that do divorce work or custody work, but it really needs to be a fertility law attorney. Um, that contract is gonna spell out the intent of who are to be the parents in this matter. It's also gonna spell out what I call all the do's and don'ts, what, what things a surrogate should do and what sh they should not do. 
you know, we have very specific things and sometimes our clients laugh that we get really, really specific, but things like a surrogate will not um, go to skydiving. They will not take change the litter in a, in a uh, litter box for a cat. Um, there's travel restrictions. There's sometimes eating, drinking restrictions. Um, maybe that they might eat organic if that's something that the parties want to agree to. Um, that the um, surrogate will not um, use um, illegal drugs or be around smoking or smoke herself. Um, but it also spells out the financial matters. So things like reimbursement for any expenses so that she's not out of pocket for any expenses. So things like, um, you know, lost wages if she goes on bed rest or um, maternity clothes or um, life insurance is typically purchased for her, or if, or if her insurance does have an exclusion for surrogacy, that health insurance is purchased, um, her co-pays, deductibles, or out-of-pocket expenses for pregnancy medical care. Um, it also spells out the compensation that she receives for being a surrogate if she's going to be a compensated surrogate. Um, and it also spells out any tax liability she has for that compensation she's receiving. Um, and then also we recommend that all money that's being paid to her be placed in an escrow account so that it's paid out per the contract. And so you're not having to deal with those money matters with your surrogate. And that way you both can just focus on the pregnancy and the delivery. All right, let's talk about the next step, which is once your surrogate is pregnant, um, are those parentage orders declaring your legal parentage. Um, we do that in the Superior Court here in Georgia. Um, and that parentage order, we typically um, recommend getting started with that in the second trimester um, of your surrogate's pregnancy. Um, and that um, action is actually a court action. Um, we make um, vital records, which um, gives out the birth certificates, and also the hospital where your surrogate is giving birth a party to this action so that they know when there is a, a legal order declaring the intended parents as the legal parents, the hospital and vital records are aware. So that way, when you're at the hospital and your surrogate's giving birth, you can make medical decisions for the baby. Um, and also so that your names can go on the birth certificate and that you can also put the baby on your health insurance. All right. Let's talk about if you have remaining embryos or eggs, sperm, or even cord blood. So if you have those remaining and those stored, a couple things to consider um, in, um, in your um, estate planning documents, and also if, God forbid, there is a divorce, um, you want to make sure that you provide for them in those documents, in your divorce documents or your estate planning documents, so that it spells out who will then receive ownership if you divorce or if you pass away, um, who will receive those um, stored genetic material, and then also who will continue to pay for the storage fees. Will it be paid out of your estate? Will it be paid by the person that's receiving it? So those need to be spelled out. And I would recommend that if you put anything on record with your fertility clinic um, about your gametes and who they're going to go to, you want to make sure it's consistent in those estate planning documents um, or in your divorce documents. So you don't wanna have inconsistent documents at the clinic um, versus say your will. So, all right. And last but not least, we are here. Um, this is also my, um, my email address and my law partner's email address. So if you have questions um, or you know, specific things, um, we always do free 15 minute consults. So feel free to call us um, or email us at any time and we're we're always happy to answer questions and help you, you know, think through the legal ramifications. Thank you, Suzanne. That was wonderful. Very informative. Thank you. So we're going to start with some uh, questions. Um, and uh, just a reminder, uh, any questions, if you could put them in the Q&A section rather than the chat, it's easier for us here. Um, we've tried home insemination for three cycles without success. What should we do next? So uh, surprisingly, I see this quite often where on the internet, you can uh, buy the equipment to do a vaginal insemination. So it's not intrauterine. 
Um, obviously, there's no ultrasound monitoring or fertility drugs. So I think if you've done home insemination without success, you should come in and be evaluated. It makes sense to make sure that you're ovulating efficiently um, and that your fallopian tubes are open. I mean, it's possible that if you've tried home insemination without success, there may be some tubal blockage. Uh, next, we have, <clears throat> I want to be a single mom by choice. Um, how do I get started to find a sperm donor? So there are lots of uh, donor sperm banks around the country, uh, and a lot of them are specific. There's certain, um, you know, Asian sperm donors and uh, European descent and, you know, different agencies that kind of uh, tailor to different uh groups. There's Jewish sperm donor groups. And here in Atlanta, we have uh, Zytec, uh, which has been around for a long time. It originated in Augusta. And so uh, there's plenty of ways to research the sperm and to uh, obtain a sperm. It's shipped directly to our uh, office, where we can use it either for IUI or for IVF. Um, what is the difference between a surrogate and a gestational carrier? So um, you may have remember from many years ago, there was a case called the Baby M case out of Pennsylvania, where that was traditional surrogacy. Traditional surrogacy, which is really no longer practiced anymore, is where the sperm of a uh, partner is uh, inseminated into a surrogate uh, and then it's that what that means is the surrogate's egg is used to make the baby. So the surrogate is essentially donating her egg and carrying the baby. And that case was famous because the surrogate changed her mind and wanted to keep the baby and the court allowed that. So it's something that's kind of messy and not used anymore. And now it's always where we use a sperm source, an egg source and then a genetically unrelated um, carrier, uh, gestational carrier to carry the baby. Um, what are the criteria for selecting the surrogate? Well, you know, Lynn talked on, uh, touched on this as well. From a medical standpoint, you want someone that's been medically cleared for pregnancy, preferably someone who's had a baby before. So typically surrogates are gonna be above 30 and they would have already have had one or two kids on their own and have a track record uh, for pregnancy. And you get a little bit more maturity, which is important compared to like an egg donor. You can have a 21 year old egg donor because her services are really needed for a couple of weeks. She donates her eggs and then she's done. Um, for a gestational carrier, it's a nine month uh, ordeal where it takes a lot more maturity and patience uh, on the part of the surrogate. Um, what We are a lesbian couple and our friend has offered to be a sperm donor. Can you help us? So we do see this uh, not infrequently where uh, a lesbian couple will come in and they say that they have uh, you know, a friend of theirs that would like to donate sperm. The important thing is that if they're not sexually intimate with this person that it is important that the person have uh, infectious disease testing, that the sperm be collected, frozen, and quarantined for six months before having a second round of infectious disease testing that would therefore allow the sperm to be released. And this is the same criteria that all sperm banks use for anonymous uh, sperm donors. Um, next, we have my sister wants to be a gestational carrier. Uh, can you work with that scenario? Absolutely. So uh, I've helped a situation where actually a mother carried uh, her daughter's baby because the daughter had cervical cancer and lost her uterus. So it was the daughter's egg with the mother carrying the baby. Uh, so absolutely, you know, the important thing with a surrogate compared to like anonymous egg donation is the intended parents are going to have a relationship at least during the pregnancy with the uh, gestational carrier. 
And, and I've seen situations before where that relationship is even maintained uh, mutually uh, by the parties afterwards. So Lynn, do we have some questions? Uh, we do, Dr. Arndt. So um, one question that we had is, um, what is Georgia surrogacy law if we are not genetically related to the child? Do we have to adopt or can we be put on the birth certificate at birth? Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, we do not have specific Georgia surrogacy laws, um, but in order to get your name on the birth certificate, um, what we would need to do, and this is regardless if there's a genetic relationship or not, um, we will need to get a pre-birth order. We do that using our declaratory judgment statute um, to get you um, on the birth certificate and to get an order declaring your legal parentage. Okay, a second question um, is, as a lesbian couple doing any fertility treatment, will my wife be put on the birth certificate? Um, this is a two-part question. So the answer to that is yes. But just being, again, on the birth certificate does not make you a legal parent. Um, and the next part of that question is, do I need to do anything um, to confirm our legal parentage rights? Um, if you are married and doing IUI, um, you are presumed by our Georgia statute to be the legal parents. However, even with that, the NCLR, the National Center for Lesbian Rights, recommends that you still do a spousal adoption. Also, if you are doing IVF, um, per the Vanderpool case I mentioned earlier, we again recommend that you do a spousal adoption so that your legal rights can be declared and assured. Okay, a third question um, is, as a gay, uh, gay male, do, I have, do you have a lot of surrogates willing to work with gay men? Yes, um, we actually do have a lot of surrogates that actually would prefer um, to work um, with same-sex couples. So that sometimes is a preference that we have surrogates that they specifically want that. So yes. Um, okay, fourth question is, um, my friend had extra embryos and offered to donate them to me. Um, she previously, previously had these embryos donated to her. Do I need to have a contract for this donation? Yes, you definitely need a contract for this donation. But the other thing that you need to look at is if they were previously donated to your friend, you need to make sure that they can be redonated. So anytime you're receiving donor embryos or, or sperm or egg from a, as a second donation, make sure that that original donor that, that produced those embryos or egg or sperm allows for sub subsequent redonation. So you need to look back at the very first contract that should spell that out. Okay. Number five, as a uh, transgender person, can I be listed on the birth certificate with the gender I identify as? Yes, you absolutely can. Um, but you wanna make sure that your birth certificate as well as your child's birth certificate has, the, has you listed under the correct gender. So you don't wanna have your child's birth certificate listing you as one gender and your own birth certificate as another gender. Um, the other thing is um, you can also be identified um, in a birth certificate. We can have you identified as parent-parent on that birth certificate or mother-father. Um, so that's another option as well. Thank you, Lynn. Go ahead. Do we have any other questions? Well, um, thank you everyone for participating. Um, and this was uh, very informative for me and I hope that I help to inform you as to uh, how you can form a family. And it's what we do every day and we derive a lot of pleasure from it and it's very gratifying work. And um, thank you, Lynn, for participating. You added a lot to the conversation today. Thank you. So my office will be uh, reaching out to y'all this week to connect with you and uh, see if we can help you in any way uh, on your journey to form a family. Thank you. Have a wonderful Saturday. Bye-bye.